Greetings all. It's that Green Garden guy again. And over here behind me is the Gracie Cat. <laughs> well, now, I had one of the long-time viewers, one of the guys who's been around quite a while, uh, he asked me if I could talk about uh, gardening, farming in uh, um, uh, with climate change. How are we going to deal with this? What sort of ideas do I have from my past experience? Because obviously, uh, <laughs> I am still you know, engaged in this entire process with the rest of you. So it's unfolding still, you know, as far as, well, I think I'll start right here in Hawaii. We have had some effect from climate change. Um, mostly breakdown of the trade winds yeah yeah the trade winds have, have broken down we don't get them like we used to so that means our rainfall isn't as consistent as it once was so that means i'm irrigating yes here in puna on the the, the wet side of the of the big island on the windward side i have been irrigating in the nursery it's been um uh, routine yeah especially in the small containers but even bigger pots yeah things are really drying out lately i gotta be careful i've had a few accidents you know or have allowed the pot to get too dry and then it resists the water you know we had a hydrophobic situation and i walk away after watering it thinking it's fine in the middle of the next afternoon it's not <laughs> right Anyway, so this climate change thing, here it's meant that container culture is drying out. Um, crops in the field, in the ground, not so much. Um, I'm on soil and so it's holding a reasonable amount of water. I use a whole lot of chop and drop, so mulch. Uh, <laughs> I guess that's the first two things that come to mind really no matter where you are uh, as weather gets more ferocious and unstable would be uh, plenty of mulch and a um, good irrigation system I qualify it as, as good uh, I, efficient would be a good way to look at it uh, i'm not a real big fan of drip irrigation but drip irrigation tends to be fairly efficient for water use and so on and so forth uh, you know there are numerous different ways uh, depending on where you're at now this could be a problem uh, <clears throat> because as climate <laughs> alters it becomes more erratic and that means so like one month you're going to be in complete baking drought and you'll be having to water your food water your plants to keep things alive but the next month it may start pouring and you may have a flood and so drainage becomes an issue now we we see that here you know right now i've been dealing with with drought hawaii is in uh, is in drought from severe to moderate pretty much all over the state right now um, <clears throat> but we also <laughs> deal with floods uh, yeah Hawaii gets the droughts and the floods pretty much like the rest of you do I guess <laughs> maybe not as often or as awful I don't know but we get them <clears throat> it can really rain out here that's for sure uh, Hilo, rainiest city of its size in the United States of America. I hear arguments from parts of coastal Alaska on that one, so that's fine. Um, anyway, so <clears throat> then we're dealing with drainage. We're dealing with drought, but we're dealing with drainage. best I can say <clears throat> is that if you plant with your crops uh, more or less elevated the crop so that we create furrows where we're planting or we use 
containers, something that lifts the crop, you know. Uh, that will bring the root zone up to a point where under most circumstances the plant will probably survive no matter how much water comes against it. Uh, now if the soil is well amended and you have a reasonable moisture holding capacity and if you have a mulch laid on top uh, you're going to find that uh, uh, well things are going to work out better for you and, and so kind of what I'm visualizing is furrows and swales furrows and swales uh, is probably the best way to approach growing and climate change because the uh, um, the furrows will allow excess water to drain away and the swales will uh, will you know create the uh, effect of drainage now it's possible that you could use a living cover crop uh, in the bottom of the of the of the swales white clover dutch white clover um, perennial peanut things like this uh, could be used in the bottom that would help hold soil in place in the case that water comes rushing through the garden during a flood episode if you use a legume well then the foliage and the roots will fix nitrogen for you uh, i wouldn't be putting the living crop though right on top of my uh, uh my crop uh, i've done this at times in the past but i found when drought uh, occurs and then you end up with problems uh, because the cover crop will draw moisture away from the, the food crop. Now, around here I find it's advantageous because of excessive rain to actually plant in groups and guilds. I would think no matter where you are that that's probably a good idea. Uh, this is basically emulating nature. As I said, if you have something down, then you have, say, like a cover crop of clover or some such thing at the ground level. Slightly above that, you may have um, small plants like uh, herbs, for instance. Some of our common herbs would be normal. Uh, pepper plants. And then you step up a bit and you could have things like tomatoes or a little bit of uh, vine like beans, peas, whatever. And then taller items over the top here i have papayas and avocados in combination over the tops of chilies and perennial peanuts and tomatoes and stuff like that um i i think the plants grow better in associations with each other now when i get way too much rain having them in groups around here are like hydraulic pumps the plants will pull that extra water up and out of the soil rather than setting in it and rotting um, now i do a lot of stick mulch i use uh, perennial peanut and pigeon pea uh, pigeon pea particularly because it's fairly rapid growing uh, tall shrubby legume tropical legume and uh, uh, so because I'm cutting and throwing this debris as uh, uh, chop and drop uh, around my plants constantly, I have good layers of compost. Well, that insulates the soil. It helps prevent it from eroding. It creates, you know, desirable uh, gr conditions in the earth beneath for fungi and bacteria and so on. Uh, but it sponges water too the organic matter is it's constantly being laid down they're like little sponges and they hold moisture um, that's going to be real beneficial as weather starts to get a little bit crazy uh, yeah a person might well might think of uh, uh, climate modification structures uh, a poly hoop houses for instance uh, they're not very expensive they're not that difficult to put up but they can really solve a lot of problems uh, if the hail isn't too bad it'll keep hail from pounding your crop uh, you know it, you can use it, it if there's free cross if suddenly the weather turns around uh, you know 
um, the same structure you can put um, shade cloth on to help prevent overheating um, that's another possibility we use shade cloth here I have it over orchid tables uh, sometimes I just use an overhanging citrus tree instead uh, you know there's various different ways you can do that but um, most of your vegetables though most of our food crops the majority of them the ones that flower they demand sun all right they don't like growing in shade if the, your plants are wilting out in the sun they probably don't have enough moisture or it can be you see here for instance where the atmospheric humidity is really high and maybe it's been raining really nice and the broccoli has just been growing like crazy under those conditions but then all of a sudden the rain stops the sun comes out and there isn't a cloud anywhere and my broccoli will go oh my goodness attempting to adjust to such intense sunlight here uh, in the tropics and it does I don't worry about it when it does that as long as there's enough moisture in the ground you know now if it's wilting like that because the ground's dry what's well, another story oh let's see what else would I do <laughs> how to deal with this yeah so enclosures uh, you know as you get into enclosures then you can start to do some things that are really uh, well less than natural you start to run with hydroponics if you want uh you know spaceship gardening it's one way to remove you from a hostile environment uh you know work inside hoop houses using hydroponics i personally uh, in a hoop house i would prefer uh large tubs i like the 20 gallon squat tree tub there's one right here next to me i got some uh, gherkins cucumbers growing in it you'll see the uh, band of copper around it i use that to keep the slugs and the snails out periodically you have to refresh the media that's in there here the uh, um, nematodes will get into it okay. yeah you, you know because of the erratic nature of climate change sometimes you know you're damned if you do and damned if you don't uh, uh, here's an example a silica gel silica gel um, I've used it before especially in ornamental plantings you know hanging baskets of petunias and stuff like this uh, to keep the flowers nice and fresh uh, the stuff swells up into cubes of jello it holds I think 20 times more moisture than most soil does and it puts it back to the soil um, I mean it's it's a reasonable uh, idea that it's pretty effective it works for drought on the other hand if it starts raining like crazy then it gets so wet that everything rots off <laughs> okay so so i say darned if you do and darned if you don't uh it depends you 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 it's hard to come up with a plan to cover every contingency um that's why we have crop failures <laughs> Yeah. and you want to have as few of those as possible wow i'll tell you what i mean i save a lot of seed i sell seed but i also buy a lot of seed seed is getting really expensive i mean i, I phew, man i can't afford to mess up with tomatoes or with broccoli anymore the seed costs me so much yeah stuff's like gold um so yeah you know, there's an expense there uh you, you want to preserve it you want to make sure that you're getting back out of that you know if you you got 15 tomato seeds for 6.95 i actually have seen this recently uh you know you get <laughs> you you would better get 15 good tomato plants out of that that produce quite a few tomatoes otherwise was it even worth the effort and the money you know yeah so insurance policies and security of course there's always the one of the most wise things ever said to me by the old gardener when i asked how many should i plant one for the weather one for the bugs and one for the gardener minimum three never plant less than three of anything 
Well, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Some things like a redwood tree, I, I don't know. If you don't need three of them, don't do that. They're really, really big vegetables. But, you know, lettuce, you want to eat one head, don't plant one head. I, I wouldn't even plant three heads. I mean, me, when I plant lettuce, I'm probably doing 20, 30 at a time, something on that order. I can usually manage to get through most of it before it starts to get old and tough, you know, or even if I have to sell some or give it away to the neighbors or something, I, that's about the right number at my house. And I, then it needs to be overlapped. The next wave of lettuce needs to overlap the last one so that by the time I'm finishing off this batch, the next one is starting to come on. Yeah, that's that's the other problem too. So for climate change, I highly recommend Sticking with inside the parameters of what has been proven in the region where you live. You know, if you're living in northern Wisconsin, for instance, and wow, man, potatoes really grow well, okay? Well, you definitely want to focus on them. Uh, you want to diversify because you never know when something's going to happen to one crop and doesn't happen to another. So you need diversification, but you also need focus. And focus would be on the things that really, really tend to thrive in the area where you live. They're more likely to make it through extreme weather than things that are on the edge. It's just rational. It's the logical viewpoint on that one. Um, yeah. Yeah, variety, too. Some varieties are going to thrive where you're at. And even though you want this one, the other one may be what produces. That is really important, too. Well, I wouldn't believe over the years all the varieties of things that I've grown, tasted, and so on uh, that I just thought were incredible, just so superior. Yet in my current garden, they just really don't want to perform, so I have to do what I can. So I find varieties that do perform. And as climate changes, you may have to continue continue that process you may not find that brandywine tomatoes thrive in your illinois garden anymore this is possible yeah you know another thought on variety too is that say for instance even though i live in a tropical environment so there's no frost to worry about no, no cold is going to put down my crop here but we have all sort of diseases and pests and stuff here that will put down a crop and put it down fast. And so sometimes I'm raising crops here that I may have raised like up by Lake Superior or even in Alaska. Um, why? Because they are so fast that they get by the problems. Sprint to the finish line, in other words, you know. Um, and I mean a lot of things like a cucumber or like a tomato. The plants don't really tend to live very long around here because the roots get full of nematodes and whatnot. And so having one that lives forever doesn't really make a whole lot of sense anyway. Uh, you need one that's really going to put it on. It's going to throw at you what you wanted in good quantities and then poop out and who cares and it's over uh yeah these are the types of things that we would raise in far northern tiers 45th parallel and up i actually use some of them here uh that adapt to this environment mm. just because they're going to run faster than the bugs okay <laughs> more later on that subject y'all hang loose aloha